I see you noticed my sword. It's called Serpent's End. My great-great-grandfather slew Overus the Sky Devourer with this very blade, liberating thousands from the dragon's tyrannical rule. It's been passed down through the generations since, and each who wielded it has accomplished noble deeds. Now that it's my turn, my heart has no greater desire Whoa, than to- Whoa! Awesome! I just found a plus one rapier! Woo! Dibs! Sometimes mechanical choices override narrative ones, and who can blame them, right? I mean, backstory doesn't give your heirloom family weapon a bonus to hit and damage. But what if it did? Today, we're gonna go over a system that allows you to create magical ancestral weapons that gain new features as they level up alongside player characters. Plus, this system lets you quick build magic weapons for loot or shops, and even allows your players to craft their own. Ready to steal some ideas? Get it, like, like steal, like the metal? like. Whatever, I'm hilarious, roll the intro. The system I'm talking about is called Ancestral Weapons. It's a short and sweet supplement by Matt Vaughn of Dungeon Rollers, and it's only five bucks. We're gonna dive into it today because the Dungeon Masters Guild has been kind enough to sponsor me for a third time now to just explore a book that I think is cool and help you decide if it's worth picking up for your own game, or at least spark some ideas. DM's Guild is a community content program partnered with Wizards of the Coast where creators can legally use official D&D material to create and share their own game content. From adventures and character options to monster collections and magic items. There are thousands of PDFs, all created by DMs like you, to open doors and solve problems in your games. You can use my code for a discount on your DMs Guild purchase of $10 or more, whether or not that includes ancestral weapons. You can find the link and the code in the description. So what is an ancestral weapon? I'm so glad you asked. The first thing to understand is that an ancestral weapon isn't just a magic item. You can't get one by looting it or buying it in a shop. It's something deeply respected, symbolic of family and history, with a long tradition behind it. Think Narsil from Lord of the Rings, Ice from Game of Thrones, or the Skywalker Saber in Star Wars. It's tied to a character's story, and as they progress through the game, this book ensures that their weapon progresses with them, so players don't have to decide between a weapon's narrative value and its practical value. There are two main ways to introduce an ancestral weapon into your game. First, a character can just start with it. This way it's written into their backstory. It's strange to wear it now. Mother used to get so angry with me when I was younger and I would sneak into her room to swing it about. Serpent's End isn't a toy, I remember her saying to me. It is a protector, capable of great violence. But in the end, it couldn't protect her. I don't know if it will protect me, but I do know she'd want me to have it by my side or the character can receive the weapon in-game. This can be a really cool development to play out at the table. Anything good in that chest, Wisteria? Um, I think you should see this. This is a beautiful blade. Great find. Look at the inscription. That's my family name. Where did you get this? There are a million ways to handle this. Maybe your player character stole their family weapon. Maybe they have to earn it by proving themselves to their parents. Maybe the player is on a quest to recover a lost or stolen ancestral weapon. Maybe they don't know their heritage and finding or receiving the weapon is their first clue. The author seems pretty focused on bloodline in this book, but it's your game and you can use the mechanics however you want. If you want to relate this powerful weapon to some other type of connection, I think you totally should. Maybe it gets past on alongside a certain title, or from master to apprentice. As long as the weapon has weight, history, and expectation associated with it, go wild, honestly. Now, anytime you want to use third-party content in a game, it's ultimately a DM decision. But if you're a player and you think this would be a good addition to your character, you can always pitch it to your DM. Personally, I think something like this is a great addition to a martial class, since those classes can sometimes struggle as they reach higher levels to keep up with casters, in terms of interesting new features and abilities. A weapon that changes over time and unlocks new options both in and out of combat can keep a fighter or a barbarian from feeling like the only changes from level to level are hitting more and hitting harder. Like, is it just me or do martial classes kind of get shafted? <laughs> 
Ancestral weapons gain their power through a mechanic called spirit points. Players earn spirit points by performing acts that would please their ancestors. Depending on the ancestors, that could be anything from heroically rescuing innocents, to taking revenge on someone who wronged the family, to getting famous or achieving a noble title. Spirit points are associated with characters' choices and actions, not level, but the book does recommend that players earn around one spirit point per level. Once earned, these spirit points can be used to purchase up upgrades. They can be spent as they're earned, saved up for bigger point value upgrades, or even swapped out, which we'll talk about in a second. There are a few different ways these upgrades can be chosen. DMs can allow players to choose their upgrades themselves, which can be really fun, and can also make sure that each upgrade is something that the player feels excited about. But if you want to keep a tighter handle on what the weapon can do, or if you want the development of the weapon to feel more mystical or predetermined, the DM can pick the upgrades instead. You don't even have to tell players that their weapons will change. It can be really compelling if each new ability comes as a surprise. What's happening? Wisteria, are you doing this? No, I'm detecting transmutation magic? It's changing somehow. Perhaps they're pleased with me. The upgrades themselves are incredibly cool. There are 130 different upgrades to choose from, which means there are literally tens of millions of possible combinations. Every ancestral weapon will be different. Each has a price from one to 10 spirit points. For example, you can pay one spirit point to take the bully upgrade, which gives you advantage on intimidation checks when the target can see you holding the weapon, or the death ward upgrade, which gives you advantage on death saves. But if you have more to spend, you can take stuff like telepathic link for three spirit points, which lets you communicate telepathically, or Blood Drinker for five spirit points, which lets you take some of the damage you deal on 19s and 20s as temporary hit points. Some of these upgrades have levels too. You can buy an upgrade and then later improve that upgrade with a few more spirit points. Like Blood Drinker gives you half the damage as temporary hit points, but for four additional spirit points, you can upgrade it to level two and get all the damage as temp HP. A few abilities are class or weapon specific, like the druid only upgrade Wild spell, which lets you ready a spell and then cast it while in wild shape, or the ranged only upgrade sniping, which reduces the effect of cover for your targets. Also, some abilities are marked limited, which means you can only have two of them at a time. This helps keep a weapon from becoming super overpowered. Limited upgrades are stuff like granting extra spell slots or flying. Now, if you're wondering how anybody would ever get those 10 point upgrades when you're only supposed to get around one spirit point per level, don't worry, you can always overwrite one upgrade, regaining the spirit points that you spent on it to purchase another one. So let's say you buy a one point upgrade, and then when you've gained two more spirit points, you overwrite that one point upgrade and buy a three point one. Even later, you can overwrite that three point upgrade to buy a 4.1 or a 5.1 and so on. If it ever becomes necessary to adjust the upgrades more heavily, the book advises that DMs have players complete an in-game quest or ritual to earn the ability to refocus the weapon and make multiple changes to the build. And of course, that's only with DM approval. These have a lot of flavor. So if you want choosing the upgrades to be a DM responsibility, I think it could be really fun to pick upgrades that line up with the family's history, the weapon's origin, or even the actions that the player took to earn their spirit point. For example, Serpent's End is a dragon slaying sword. Giving it the infusion upgrade to make it deal additional fire damage or the flying upgrade to give the wielder flight would really drive home the narrative of the weapon's origin. As you can see, a lot of this depends on the weapon and the ancestors who provide it with power having a story. But you don't have to come up with that on your own. The book has some guidance, so let's take a stab at it. There are two whole chapters full of rolling tables to help you figure out the weapon's history, materials and appearance, ancestral traits, and even personality. Ancestral traits each have some sort of small effect on the game. For example, a weapon with the trait longing will start to hum when away from its owner for too long, and a weapon with the trait malice will deal a small amount of damage to anyone besides the wielder who picks it up. Ancestral personalities are more about roleplay flavor than about mechanics, and should help DMs identify what sort of achievements could earn spirit points. For for example, a weapon that has come to you from violent ancestors will respond strongly to bloodshed, while a weapon with a calculating personality might reward clever, cautious choices. The first time I had a dream where I was holding Serpent's End, I thought nothing of it. Just a nightmare, I thought. But that nightmare came true. It was an omen. The blade, or perhaps my ancestors, were warning me. I pay more attention to my dreams now. 
Of course, the weapon's traits and personality had to come from somewhere. That's where the history comes in. You can roll on a table to determine how many generations the weapon has been in the character's family, and which feats of legend are associated with it, from slaying a ruler to being blessed by a god. There are even tables to determine what race crafted it, what type of wood or metal was used, and even what identifying features make this weapon look different from your average one. You can use these tables for ideas, or just roll at random. You know, if you're on the fence. Now, ancestral weapons are special. They can't be sold or stolen or looted, or at least if they are, they don't retain all their ancestral powers. But all those same mechanics can be used to quick build standard magic weapons that you can use as loot, stock in shops, or arm your NPCs with. There's a nice simple table that tells you how many spirit points correlate with item rarity and how much the item should cost. This makes it super quick and easy to not just create cool magic weapons, but understand their power level and their impact on the game. As someone who hasn't done a ton of item homebrew, I'm often nervous to introduce items I've built into a game for fear that they'll end up broken or overpowered. I can tell you that for me personally, this section makes me feel very confident that I could bring in some really exciting custom weapons that will function as intended in play. In fact, the use of spirit points to easily identify an item's power level also makes it possible to allow your players to craft magic weapons without worrying that they're going to create something game-breaking. There's a table that helps DMs determine how much it should cost and how long it should take for for a character to craft their own weapon with some of the abilities in this book. The author also suggests requiring unique materials, like a dragon's claw, to make the creation of the weapon part of the story, and to really emphasize that building a truly legendary weapon is no easy task. Of course, no matter if the DM or the player builds a weapon using these rules, it's still not an ancestral weapon. It's static. It doesn't gain spirit points. Only weapons that have been empowered by epic feats and generations of power can do that. Who knows? Maybe at the end of your campaign, a character will pass their weapon down to their next of kin, and the heroic acts that played out at your table will become the stuff of legends generations down the line, turning what was once a normal weapon into an ancestral weapon. I guess you'll only know if you stick with it. Honestly, for under five bucks, I can't think of a reason not to pick up ancestral weapons. This feels almost like a dungeon master cheat code, because giving players a weapon that ties their backstory to the actual mechanics of gameplay is a next level DM move. And this supplement makes it so easy to execute. But if it's not your thing, there's so much on DM's Guild, all you have to do is browse, and I'm sure you'll find something to use this discount code on. Check the description for the link and the terms, and if you're hungry for more homebrew, check out this last video that I did for DM's Guild, all about an elf and an orc had a little baby, which allows you to create playable mixed race D&D characters. I cosplay a tiefling centaur in that video. I guarantee you will not regret clicking it.